And uh, let me start off by introducing Kaja Nowatsky, who's helping us out here. She's new to ACUS. Welcome, Kaja. Uh, she's going to start off by taking the role. Thank you, Kristen. Um, hi, everybody. I'm very excited to have this be my first committee meeting. Um, Kristen, so we're going to call roll. Um, if you can just unmute yourself and say here uh, when your name is called so we can just make sure that your microphone is working and that we can mark you down for attendance. Um, we're going to start with the committee members. Um, okay, so Kristen Hickman. Here. Here. Uh, Boris Burstein. Not yet. Okay. Um, Susan Braden. Betty Jo Christian. John Duffy. Here. Great. Thank you, John. Don Elliott. Here. Thank you. Deepak Gupta. Here. Thank you. Paul Kaminar. I know he was here. Paul he was here a second ago. Again. Yeah, I'm here. I had to push the unmute button. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. Ron Levin. Here. Thank you. Albert Lynn. Here. Thank you. Mary McQueen. David Michaels. Stephanie Middleton. Jeff Manier. I'm here. Great, thank you. Alan Morrison. Here. Thank you. Randolph Moss. Victoria Norse, Lee Otis, Deborah Perlin, Jay Plager, Eleni Rumel, Eleni, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to say your name if you are here. Um, Eugene Splia. David Shanka. Here. Thank you. John Siegel. Stephanie Tatham. Hi, I'm here. Thanks. Great, thank you. Drita Tanuzi. Hi there. I'm here, but I wanted to note that I have to drop off in about an hour. So I've asked Emily Lesnia to come in and to uh, stay for the second half. Okay, Thank you, everybody, and Thank welcome you. on board. Thank you. Uh, David Trissel, Cheryl Walter, Kenny Wright, Allison Zeev. Um, so those are our, our committee members. I am also going to call roll of our ACUS non-committee members, um, two of whom uh, oh, before I get to that, is there anyone who's on the committee whose name I did not call or who did not hear their name? Hi, Boris Burstein. I joined just a little late. That's okay. Thank you, Boris. I have you down. And Kaja, let me note that uh, Susan Braden has indicated in the chat that she is here, but on mute. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. And for our ACUS non-committee members, um, is William Funk here? Here. Thank you. And Leslie Cooper Vegan, who is an alternate for Susan Davies. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, are there any ACUS non committee members that are in attendance that I didn't call? Okay. And then lastly, is Emery Lee here? I'm here. Yes. Great, Hi. thank you so much, Ty. Um, okay, so that is roll and uh, I will turn it back over to Kristen. Wonderful, thanks so much, Kaja. Uh, next on our agenda is opening remarks, if any, from our fearless leader, Matt Wiener. 
Um, thanks, Kristen. Um, just a few comments at the outset. First, I'd just like to welcome, we have some at uh, least two, maybe three new members here. Uh, Deepak Gupta is, has just joined ACUS and, and, uh, and the committee with it. Um, and uh, Susan Davies from DOJ. I, I'm sorry, I missed it. Do we, does Susan have an alternate here from DOJ? I'm sorry, I missed that. Yes, uh, Leslie Vegan. I'm the I'm the alternate for DOJ. For okay, well, well, welcome, Leslie. And also, I would like to extend a special welcome to uh, Emery Lee from the Federal Judicial Center. Um, and um, you'll see in a moment that he probably will have a lot to contribute to our discussion. Emery, what is your title? I for, always forget. I'm a senior research associate. You are the senior research associate. Maybe that would be a better way to put it. And you're also just to be clear, I am a senior research associate. I don't want any of my colleagues to hear that. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> one of your one of your colleagues, uh, another of your colleagues who is here is uh, Jeff Manier, who is counselor to the Chief Justice and also the liaison rep from the Judicial Conference. And we're very glad to have Jeff here as well, um, because there are just a few. Uh, new members, and and um, I would just like to say a word about ACUS's recommendations and work on the judicial review front. Very, very briefly, um, this question often arises as to what ACUS's statutory authority is. Um, we are authorized by statute to make recommendations to the Judicial Conference of the United States uh, and to Congress. Um, I would say that I don't have an official count, but the vast majority of ACUS's recommendations, and Reeve, jump in if I misstate anything or you have anything to add, but the vast majority of ACUS's recommendations on the judicial review, on the subject of judicial review, have been to Congress for statutory reforms. We've also issued um, some to the Judicial Conference for proposed rule changes, an example being the recommendation from several years ago. Uh, that the judiciary develop special rules for social security cases in the district courts. And that, by the way, that, that, that rule change is, is forthcoming pretty soon, we expect from the judicial conference. Um, so rule changes. And then we have a very small number of recommendations um, that have been directed maybe more directly to the federal courts. Um, you could think of them as recommendations on matters of legal doctrine. They're pretty few and far between. I have my own views on the propriety of doing that and the wisdom of doing that, but I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, I'll leave my personal views aside on that. Um, let me just say one more thing, if I may. We have two kinds of projects um, at the conference. Um, one or one projects directed to the formulation of recommendations. We also, those are the ones you're most familiar with um, and the ones that um, uh, th that are probably most common. Um, but we also, uh, we also undertake projects that aren't directed to the formulation of recommendations. We sometimes call them Office of the Chairman projects, but these are projects that will result in a uh, report uh, a database, some other collection of information, a source book, so forth and so on, um, that might in, in turn suggest the need for or form the basis of a recommendation project, but just sometimes have, has intrinsic worth to policymakers, agencies, Congress, the courts, and so forth um, in their own right, just as sort of an informational resource. So I just want to, I just want to um, point that out. And one, one last thing on that front is um, a few of us had a conversation with um, Emery um, uh, a few weeks ago about um, collecting um, data on judicial review from the federal courts. And I think it would be useful at some point if, um, if Emery said a few words on that subject. And Steph Tatham, um, who had originally raised the idea of doing some kind of empirical study of judicial review in the federal courts, especially the federal district courts, may have something to say on the subject uh, as well. There are some significant research challenges associated with that. So um, unless anyone have any, has any questions, I will turn it back to you, Kristen. And um, I think this will be a um, very productive meeting. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, yeah, so let me just say a few words about our agenda today, and then uh, I'm going to go through a few rules, especially recognizing we've got several people on our call who have not been to a committee meeting before. Um, so 
the basic gist of our meeting today is uh, to talk about potential future projects. Uh, in our various meetings regarding uh, last spring and this summer regarding recommendation 2021-5, clarifying statutory access to judicial review of agency action based on John Siegel's excellent source book. Um, during those deliberations, various additional ideas for possible future, future projects were sort of floated or mentioned um, as we carved things off that were not covered by that recommendation. Um, given the context in which those ideas arose, it's a little hard to know how much interest there is in pursuing them or just how viable they really are. Uh, so we thought we'd call this meeting to talk about them and plot our agenda going forward. I will tell you at the outset, that uh, between personnel changes at ACUS and holes in my own notes, in a couple of instances, it's not entirely clear to me exactly how some of these ideas get turned into projects, uh, but that's why we have a committee. Uh, and if there's one thing I really enjoy about working on ACUS, it's that I learn every time I go through one of these committee meetings. So uh, I really look forward to uh, your recollections and welcome your thoughts and suggestions. Um, before we dive into uh, the individual topics for discussion, let me just summarize briefly for those who, particularly for those who are new to our committee, uh, the protocols uh, of you know things like voting. Given the nature of our discussion today, I'm not sure how relevant these protocols are going to end up being, but I think it's worthwhile to mention them anyway. Um, so please remember that only ACUS members. And that includes government members, public members, senior fellows, liaison representatives, and special counsels, but only ACUS members, whether they're on the committee or not, or their designated alternatives have full speaking privileges. So never to avoid background noise, I would ask that you keep your microphone on mute and either use Zoom's hand raising feature or add a comment in the chat meet feature indicating that you'd like to speak. And then I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself. And then after you've made your comment or suggestion or raised your question, then you can remute yourself when you're done speaking. Um, I would also ask ACUS members and their designated alternates whenever possible to use their webcams to facilitate conversation. Um, it's, it's a lot nicer to talk to people when you see their faces. Although I also recognize that um, different people's Wi-Fi connections sometimes make using the webcams uh, a little bit more challenging in terms of maintaining connections. So everybody just do the best we can as we typically do and it'll, it'll all go just fine. Um, with respect to attendees other than ACUS members and alter alternates, participation requires the unanimous consent of the committee members. Um, time permitting, I'll consider calling on such attendees at appropriate points and we can presume that committee members consent absent their raising an objection given the difficulty of voting under these circumstances. Um, so if any participant in this call who is not an ACUS member or alternate would like to speak, again, please indicate as much in the chat feature or by using the Zoom hand raise feature and then just wait to speak until I call on you. You can then unmute yourself and then again pre-mute please remute yourself uh, when you're done speaking. For everybody though, um, let me remind uh, everyone to please use the chat feature only to indicate that you'd like to speak um, or in the event that we need to take a vote for some reason uh, for committee members and their alternates to vote when you're asked to do so. Please do not hold substantive sidebar discussions in the chat or put substantive comments in the chat feature. Um, it can be difficult to keep up with them as they're scrolling along while we're simultaneously trying to hold a conversation orally. Um, I'm not sure that they end up getting recorded in the same way as uh, you know the, the, the conversation that we're having. And so please just use the chat uh, for purposes of signaling that you would like to speak. Um, one last reminder is that should we take a vote uh, on anything, only members of the Judicial Review Committee uh, 
including government members and their designated alternates, public members, senior fellows, liaison representatives, and special counsels, but only members of the Judicial Review Committee have a vote. Please don't vote if you're not a member of the committee. And uh, Kaja has a list of committee members in case you're unsure who is on, if you're on the committee or not. Um, with that, with no further ado, um, let's turn, let, let, let's move then to talking about uh, the four topics that are listed on the agenda, um, starting with choice of forum. Um, so one topic that came up repeatedly uh, in our conversations over the spring and the summer had to do with choice of forum between federal district court or federal court of appeals when it comes to seeking judicial review of agency action. ACUS previously took up this topic in 1975 with recommendation 75-3. And there was some suggestion that perhaps revisiting the topic would be appropriate. Um, as Matt mentioned, the ACUS staff has done some preliminary investigation concerning this topic, uh, including obtaining some cursory statistics from the Federal Judicial Center. We have Emery Lee with us here today from the Federal Judicial Center to tell us a little bit more about the possibilities and potential limitations for any sort of empirical analysis regarding this topic, although I understand that Te Steph Tatum may also have some things to say. So let me start off by calling on Emery uh, to, to give us some thoughts regarding this topic. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I guess, unless someone's gonna object to me speaking, right? No, nope. go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, and just to be clear, um, I'm, I'm here, I'm speaking in my individual capacity. I, I, I can't bind my agency to any action or, or commit to anything today, but I can, I can definitely answer questions. Um, so the question I, I was asked uh, a while back is um, looking at where challenges to agency action are filed in the federal courts. And I'm gonna just real quick, I'm only talking about Article Three courts. I don't have any data on Article One courts. Um, and of course, cases can either go, I explain this to this group of people, all of whom know more about this than me, right? Uh, they could go to uh, the courts of appeals or to the district courts. Uh, and so we have, we do have court data uh, uh, for both of those levels of courts. And that's called what that's called the publicly available data is what's called the integrated database. So we have the appellate integrated database and then the civil integrated database for the district courts. Uh, assuming we're not talking about criminal, there's a criminal one too. Just so we have the civil for the district courts and appellate IDB. Um, the appellate IDB, I think, makes it fairly straightforward to identify the vast number of these cases. Um, obviously, I haven't done this myself, but just looking at what what's available, um, and that's some of the preliminary data you may have seen. Um, the the civil the the appellate database does make it possible to identify cases that are filed in the courts of appeals that are challenges to agency actions, and you should actually be able to track what agency action, uh, what agency is involved in those actions. Um, and uh, that's that's pretty straightforward. I won't say much more about that unless there are questions. Um, the district court's a lot trickier. There's no, as best I can tell, uh, there's no straightforward way to do it in the district court database the same way there is in the appellate database. Um, I think you'd ha it'd have to be worked out when we talk about potential challenges here. Um, there are there are ways to do that. There are there are things to do with the publicly available data, though. It's very tricky um, to get at. I think it could be done, but I don't have a solution to do it today. I thought of a new way to do it, by the way, uh, preparing for this meeting, which is um, one of the disposition codes for civil cases is remand to administrative agency. Those would be a good set of cases to sample and look at here. Uh, I hadn't thought about that before uh, today, so we, coming up with that. Um, like I said, those are, that's in the publicly available data, uh, and I'm more than happy to help uh, researchers. Um, I, I do this a lot in my regular, this is my job actually, to help researchers to uh, access and use the publicly available data to answer research questions. Um, and I, I've done that with uh, ACUS studies before I did that with the Social Security Disabilities Appeal Study, for example, uh, that was already mentioned. So that, that's no problem. Um, of course, the courts have lots of data that's not publicly available, and 
that generally that's a very different set of issues, which if there were a study that would have to be worked out and I can't, um, this would be a very strange, this would be strange. I don't think, I don't know where this fits in the existing policies to be honest, and it would have to be worked out. Um, but again, so my short answer, and if there are questions I can answer those, the Court of Appeals, I think relatively straightforward to answer. District Court uh, is gonna be a little bit trickier. I think it could be done, but it's gonna take a fair amount of thought to think about how to get at that. And when I mentioned the IDB, you know, uh, I've said this, and I know I've already talked too long, but um, the IDB is a good place to start. This will help identify the court records that would have to be reviewed either probably manually, probably we talk about human review of the dockets and the, and the documents to, to sort of hone in on, on the data that you want to collect. But the IDB does provide a good place to start, especially for those appellate cases. And I can take questions. Okay, um, you know, let me, uh, well, let me, uh, let me uh, give members of the community or community committee opportunity to either uh, raise your hand using the raise hand feature or to, um, or to uh, signal in the chat you want to speak. Um, Steph, I don't know if you want to weigh in in this conversation since Matt specifically mentioned he thought you might have some ideas. Uh, but I do see Alan Morrison's hand. So let me call on Alice, Alan Morrison, please. Thank you, uh, Kristen. Uh, I apologize. I have to leave early because I have another meeting. And uh, I, I do have some thoughts on this one in particular and I made on the others. Uh, the, fir the first thing is uh, the, the problem in the district court is that the defendant, in the, well, I, I, I think you could probably separate out those cases in the district court, in which the government or the government agency is the plaintiff, but I don't think that's what we're, we're really trying to look at in this study. Um, the second is, I, I know from my own personal experience that sometimes we sued the agency and sometimes we sued the head of the agency, often for no particular reason. <laughs> I occasionally sometimes to keep them straight. Uh, so we had different defendants in different cases. Uh, and, and the second is, I think what the other thing is that some of these cases are challenges to particular applications of an existing statute or a rule, and others are challenges to the rule. So for example, in FDA, you had to challenge it to go to the district court. And so I, I take it that the problem here is we're trying to look for cases that end up in the district court that are analogous to the cases that go directly to the court of appeals. And I think that that's gonna be a hard thing to, to eliminate. The third thing is, of course, we have all these FOIA cases and EEOC cases that have the same defendants in them uh, in many cases, and I don't think anybody's talking about trying to move those out of it well. So I, I think it's a good project. I, I would like to see us uh, try to work on it and try to get some data, but it's going to take a lot of work to get empirical data on that. And the other thing is, you know, we might think about trying to go back to the agencies themselves that, that we know have split authorities like FDA and some others and see if they have any data or DOJ has any data on, on this. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's, uh, those are my thoughts. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I will note, I, so I went back and looked at the old recommendation 75-3 in this regard. And, um, you know, it talks about, you know, sort of seems to have a general preference for court of appeals, except it then singles out a whole bunch of different things um, as possible exceptions. But uh, there was a separate statement that was attached that suggested that uh, one of the problems with the recommendation was that uh, it hadn't adequately, I guess, sought the views of the agency most affected and best informed. Um, so going to the agencies, I would think would be something that would definitely be something to be done uh, if we wanted to uh, pursue this project. Steph, I see your hand is up. Um, sure, I'll just, um, you know, thank the committee for, um... Steph, you just muted yourself somehow. Thank you for letting me know. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. I, I would commend the, um, this project to the committee. You know, when I was working at ICAS probably seven years ago now as staff counsel to the Committee on Judicial Review, one of the things that made developing projects difficult was just a lack of information about which agencies were most frequently engaged in litigation and which courts and under which statutes. And I think 
all of those questions are probably a bit too much to take on in this project, but I do think that it would be helpful to have a better understanding of the lay of the land and the distribution of federal administrative litigation. Um, and that would also help us to understand if the old recommendation had been implemented or if there was variance from those recommendations over time um, and, you know, to explore the possible causes of those variances and the need to refresh those earlier recommendations. Um, like Alan, I was going to raise the possibility of administrative data matching with DOJ and or the agencies. Um, and, and then the final comment I would just make is that I'm, I'm very glad to see that Emery Lee is here because he's truly the, the expert on these issues and we would definitely need his assistance. Um, this is the type of project that I think if ACUS doesn't do it and find a willing professor with a host of research assistants or engage the staff itself, I just don't know who's going to undertake it, but I think it would be of immense value to civil proceduralists, to administrative law scholars, um, and to the administration. Thanks so much, Steph. Um, Emery, I had seen you raise your hand again earlier, but then you put it down. I just wanted to mention to Alan, um, first of all, hi, Alan. Uh, second of all, uh, FOIA cases are no problem. We can we can easily, I can take the FOIA cases out. FOIA is good. I'm, um, so that, that just wanted to mention that because he mentioned FOIA. Other thoughts and, 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 and ideas or, or questions or concerns about this project idea? Well, I'm not seeing any, um, you know, I guess the question I would have uh, for Matt and for Kaja is, do you have what you need in order for us to move on to the next project idea? Yeah, I think that's helpful. I think one of the things that we need to discuss internally and, and, and with you, Kristen, is um, whether if we undertake a pro an empirical study um, to address, among other things, as Stephanie put it, the dis distribution of review cases across the federal court. If we were to undertake that study, would it be best to do it in the first instance, um, just as a research study uh, by the office of the chairman, um, that um, and 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 then to see after we've undertaken all or at least some of the research. Um, whether the research would suggest the need for a recommendation project of some sort. I mean, I just recall that the last project that this committee took up, the clarifying statutory access, that actually arose out of the office of the chairman study that, that resulted in John Siegel's source book. So when we began that project, we didn't necessarily contemplate a recommendation. And then after John had done all his research, um, John identified some areas that would, um, that could, that, that would, were, should be put before the committee for formulating a recommendation. So that would be one thing we would want to discuss um, internally. Um, you know whether to uh, you know whether to proceed sort of in maybe a two-step process, if you will. And then, of course, if we were to undertake this research, we'd have to see um, what price tag would be attached to it and and who would do it. This is probably one on which we would want. Um, probably a small team of scholars, and we probably would want to draw, uh, especially from uh, scholars who do empirical research on federal litigation, and there certainly uh, are any number of them, uh, including two of the scholars who are working on a pending office of the chairman project we're doing on nationwide injunctions. Thank you, Matt. Those are also very good considerations uh, that, that we should take into account. And now we have a flurry of hands in the queue. So why don't I call on Albert Lynn to be followed by Don Elliott? Hey, Kristen. Thanks. I'm sorry I didn't raise, I was looking for the agenda because I thought maybe I, I didn't want to ask a, a question that had already been answered. But my question is, uh, it just isn't clear to me what sort of what is the what is the mandate that we're talking about here? And I get Matt sort of answered that in, in the sense that he suggested maybe it's just sort of a survey project where we kind of figure out where these cases are going. Um, but I, and then maybe there's some question of recommendation, but I, I guess I, what I was just trying to figure out is, you know, what it what is it that we're setting out to do? Uh, and I thought maybe I had missed that, um, but I, I didn't see anything <laughs> in the agenda about it. No, you haven't missed anything. I mean, believe me, in preparing for this call, like I said earlier, you know, I, whether it's holes in my own notes or holes in the notes of people at ACUS or just, you know, sort of the heat of the moment of going through a recommendation where we carve something off and say maybe we could study that in the future. And then, you know, now's the future where we're trying to decide whether to study it or not. 
you know, there's a lot of, there's an, a, a great extent to which my question with respect to all four of the items on the agenda is, you know, where's the project? What are we trying to accomplish? What do we, what do we want to do here? Um, and that's why we have these meetings uh, is just bat that around. But that is one interesting point. I think, you know, Matt's point about the, uh, an office of the chairman project starting off that way and thinking in terms of the possibility of two tiers. I know, you know, there's a project I'm working on right now where we're, we're an office of the chairman project precisely because we don't know what's going to come out of it. We're interested in studying. We know there's an, we, we know that there's sort of a topic. We think that there may be something interesting to explore or something to say, but at the same time, we're not sure exactly what recommendation anybody might envision until we have data to look at, right? So that could be part of the idea, I think. But let me go to Don Elliott for his thoughts. Well, well, I had a concern, uh, somewhat, somewhat like Elbert's, that I wasn't sure what we were, what we were really trying to study. I'm all in favor of uh, empirical work. I think it would be helpful to try to identify some some policy questions that um, such an empirical study might address. I think it's going to be necessary to do that in terms of deciding what kind of data one, one captures. And just to give a, a specific example, uh, one longstanding issue that has been of particular interest to, to me, partially because of my EPA background, is the, the practice that some pre-enforcement or facial challenges to reviews, uh, to, to rules rather, um, go go into the district court rather than uh, the Court of Appeals, simply because there isn't a, a statute directing them into the Court of Appeals. That's been often criticized as, you know, an unnecessary review step, uh, because then those cases tend to get appealed to the, the Court of Appeals anyway. And because uh, these tend to be challenges on an existing notice and comment record, and so therefore the fact finding in the uh, in the, in the district court is not really necessary. I would think in designing an empirical study, that might be an example of the kinds of questions that would, one would want to identify and make sure that we developed an empirical information about. That is, uh, to what extent are cases going into the district court where there isn't a need for fact finding, where there are, are, cha where, where there are challenges to, uh, uh, to, to facial challenges to rules. And I, I think that that's certainly not the only question. It's really intended as an illustration that I think before we make a recommendation for a, an empirical study, uh, we as a, a committee and we as, as ACUS ought to try to identify for some of the scholars doing the work, uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of questions we're interested in trying to get empirical answers to rather than simply leaving that defaulting and leaving that to the people doing the study who will uh, decide what, uh, what, what particular features they're going to be looking at. So I, I, would, I would advocate that as one topic, but I'm sure there, uh, I'm sure there are others. John, if I just, just a footnote to your comment, but I think what you say is exactly right. Um, ACUS has issued at least, you might know better than I, but one, if not two recommendations in the environmental context, I think one of them on waters of the United States, um, and uh, we could send that along to you, but we have spoken on that particular issue. Yeah, I, I am aware of that, but I think as long as we're doing a, an empirical study, um, I, I think it would be important to capture this kind of uh, this kind of data because I think that would uh, you know empower some of our recommendations. And my my recollection is that uh, the Congress hasn't really always followed the ACUS recommendations in this area, which I think have generally favored sending cases uh, directly to the Court of Appeals if there's no need to develop a record in the in the district court. So I think it's I think it's important to try to develop um, empirical information. And having done some empirical studies myself, not many, but a few, um, I think it's very important to have in mind in advance, as I think Elbert was suggesting, what questions you're trying to answer. Um, you, you know, it's fine to say, let's do an empirical study, but an empirical study of what? Mm -hmm. um, Boris, to be followed by Steph. 
Well, I actually have a comment that uncharacteristically follows naturally right after uh, Don's and, uh, and Albert's. Um, I, I guess the, the thing I was struggling with is the fact that there seems to be a recommendation, admittedly, you know, a 45 year old one that appears to be exactly on point. And so the, 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 the question I was trying to, I was struggling with a bit is, uh, is the question we're answering whether that recommendation is still current um, and the empirical study is with a view to updating that recommendation? Or is the question we're answering whether the reality 45, year, 45 years hence has conformed with ACUS's views and whether additional view, additional changes are needed to align practice with our recommendation? Or is it some third question? Because I think, I think knowing at least, at least at this high level of generality, what, what, what we're trying to inquire into, I think will bear a lot on what data we're gonna need. Sure, um, and let me call on Steph. Steph may have some ideas in this regard. I don't, and <laughs> unfortunately my segue is not as natural as uh, Boris's, but I was just going to point out that, you know, and regrettably we're not in the committee room and I don't know if the quote is still on the wall, but the administrative conference acts in its purposes does include a purpose of reducing unnecessary litigation and the regulatory process. And folks on this committee in particular may have different views about when litigation is necessary or, or not, but, you know, just helping that the project could just help us to understand where the most litigation is occurring. And I would defer to Emory and you know any scholars that take, take this up on whether or not we could even get to the level of detail as to whether the litigation specifically involves regulation or if it concerns you know, adjudications or, or other matters. But I, I do think keeping that statutory charge <clears throat> in mind of this project could be helpful to helping us, you know, figure out how to reduce unnecessary litigation in the regulatory process moving forward. I will make one additional observation while I invite anyone else who wants to speak on this topic to raise their hand. Um, you know, so one question I have, I guess, you know, I, I, I can, anytime you have a, it seems to me that you have a recommendation that is almost as old as I am at this point. Um, you know, my inclination is to say, you know, maybe there's some merit in going and looking to see if it should be updated. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's, it's I, I wonder in looking at recommendation 75-3, whether and to what extent empirical analysis is what we need versus talking to agency officials, maybe talking to agency officials for that matter, um, you know, I know there's a little bit of a concern about uh, agency officials feeling overloaded by a ACUS interview requests, but on the other hand, um, talking with some agency officials to try to get an idea about whether um, there's some value in trying to update this recommendation. Um, maybe that's something before going down the empirical path, um, do a little bit of preliminary investigation into these questions about what questions we have to answer. Um, anyway, I'm not seeing any other hands. So Kristen, last can I just, just, just on that, I think that's an excellent idea. And, um, um, I think we, you know, if one place you could start there is you could start with agencies that don't have statutes that steer all their cases into the course of appeals. I mean, that would be one place to start, but you could very well imagine, uh, that is a first step. And then of course, a much more narrow, narrowly targeted empirical study um, rather than something that canvasses all litigation over say a 15 year period. Sure, sure, which would cut down on the on the, the manpower needed as well in that regard. Um, anyway, um, so last call before uh, we move on to topic B. Okay, seeing no further hands, um, let's move on to that next topic. Um, which is labeled accrual of cause of action. So this idea comes up from a line in a footnote in recommendation 2021-5. The relevant footnote language said that the recommend, that recommendation was not intended to address the time of accrual of a right of action under the general statute of limitations in 28 USC section 2401A, with a citation to Wind River Mining Corporation versus United States from the Ninth Circuit, 
which concerned whether the right of action uh, accrued under, under, when the agency's decision was first published in the Federal Register or when the agency appellate body affirmed the dismissal of the challenger's action against the agency. Uh, and also that opinion made a distinction in this regard between substantive challenges and procedural challenges. Um, you know, so notwithstanding the line in the footnote, I guess my question for the committee is whether and to what extent anyone sees a potential project for this committee with respect to the applicability of 28 USC section 2401. Hands, anybody? John Duffy, please go ahead. Hi, thanks. I um, I think I'm one of the people who um, called out this issue when we were um, working on the earlier recommendation. And um, it, it's in part due, uh, there's an issue here that is, I, I don't think it's a very big issue. In fact, I think one of the things we might think about doing is these next three issues, I think really go together in, in, in the sense that they are all about the timing and availability of judicial review. Um, and so I view this as kind of an, a, a part of it. I think doing a whole project on it is, um, is, is, uh, too, is it might be overkill. Um, the basic issue is that the general statute of limitations that's in the judicial code, 28 USC, says that uh, states a general cause of action for causes of action against the United States. DC circuit precedent, pretty pretty old DC circuit precedent has said, oh, that's, that's the statute of limitations that applies to the APA. The APA has no statute of limitations in it. Um, the problem with the cause of action is that it, 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 or the problem with the case law, I should say, is it requires accrual by its terms. And the, the, the um, courts, or at least older courts, including the Ninth Circuit, haven't been happy about that. They think, well, wait a minute, accrual, you know, that, that means the time when you're, you're, you know, normally when you get a cause of action, which means you have to have standing to challenge the agency's decision. And a lot of times the, the uh, entity that's challenging the agency's decision might not have even existed. It might not have been incorporated yet. It might not, the person, if it's a real person, might not have been born yet. Um, so the general statute of limitations could go on for a long time. The courts have tried to sort of do some things like the Wind River case to sort of get out of the text of the statute. Um, and it, I think they've created kind of a mess. Now, many cases in judicial review are brought very, very quickly by sophisticated counsel in Washington. There is this problem that sometimes the real import of an agency decision doesn't become apparent or no one has standing to challenge it for a while. And, uh, and then there's this issue of, well, has the six years run? And the agencies, the DOJ and the agencies um, tend to take the position that the statute of limitations should be read like a what's called in the field of statutes of limitation. And there is a literature, of course, on it. They call it statutes of repose, which actually say that it's it, it's not based on a time of accrual. It's based on the time of the defendant's action. It's you know it's a thing that's out there in in not just in ad law but in you know statutes of limitations generally. You can either say it's a time of accrual, which looks to the plaintiff, or you can say it's a time of the defendant's action. And you know we're going to give repose to the defendant after X number of years. The defendant just knows uh, he or she or it can't be sued anymore. So this, I think this is a, 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 an important issue. It's an important corner of the world, um, which is filled with confusion in the lower courts. Um, but I can't see really doing a single project on just this one thing. It seems to me like the, this, along with the next two that we're gonna discuss, really do deal with these issues of timing um, and avail, you know, I guess sort of you can even think of the exhaustion issue as, as, as kind of a timing thing. Do you have to raise it at the agency? You know, and um, so I would, 
I, I think this would be a great project for the, for the, I think it would be a great part of a project for uh, the committee. Um, and I think the others, I'll speak in favor of those in due course, but I think that, you know, maybe we should think about putting one, this one, you know, piggybacking it on one of the other two that are to come. Thanks. Well, how about, I mean, let, not seeing any hands, um, let me offer this as a suggestion because I, I, I hear what you're saying, John. Let me briefly summarize each of the other two topics and we can discuss them individually, but maybe there's an extent we ought to which we ought to talk about them collectively. Um, since part of the problem I was having with respect to thinking about each of these as an individual topic was sort of one of framing and how does it become a reasonable project for this committee, maybe if we put our collective heads together about all three of them at the same time, we can come up with a framing that then creates a project that somebody could take the ball and run with. Um, so let me just go through the other two topics on the list and then we'll see uh, where we're at. So with respect to issue exhaustion, I think and, you know, those of us who have been paying attention to what's going on in the Supreme Court um, you know, the, the, are, are familiar with this as kind of a topic at the moment. John Siegel's source book noted that some of the specific judicial review statutes that he examined contained issue exhaustion requirements uh, and his source book then went on to provide a brief discussion of issue exhaustion more generally. Of course, the Supreme Court addressed issue exhaustion this past term in Carr versus Saul as well, holding that it was inappropriate to judicially impose an issue exhaustion requirement on challenges by Social Security benefits claimants regarding the constitutionality of the appointment of the administrative law judges who heard their claims. Um, just for some additional background, Acres considered issue exhaustion previously, but again, it was a long time ago in 1982 with recommendation 82-7, which predates, of course, not only Carr versus Saul, but also the prior issue exhaustion case of Sims versus Apfel, which the Supreme Court decided some a, a, a few years back. Um, so that's something else that sort of came out of the discussions of recommendation 2021-5 is the possibility of returning to the topic of issue exhaustion, uh, especially where you've got statutory, recognizing that there are statutory provisions regarding issue exhaustion. Um, topic D, availability of review and enforcement proceedings, again stems from a footnote in recommendation 21-5. Uh, which made clear that the recommendation was not intended to address the extent to which judicial review remains available after the expiration of a time period specified in a specific statute authorizing pre-enforcement judicial review of agency rules. Um, you know, this is probably where my own notes are the least clear, but prior re ACUS recommendations have suggested that Congress should be aware of statutory language that would allow parties to challenge rules in the context of enforcement proceedings, where you then have another statute that imposes a limitations period for pre-enforcement challenges against agency rules. Um, this issue came up to some extent with, it, it, with respect to the Hobbs Act in PDR Network versus Carlton and Harris Chiropractic in, in 2019 before the Supreme Court. Um, you know, so again, you know, if you if you take these issues of um, the accrual of a cause of action under 28 U.S.C. 2401A, issue exhaustion and availability of review and enforcement proceedings, I wonder to what extent we can think of a framing that maybe picks up some of these hangover issues from 2021-5, um, you know, these timing issues uh, to, to, to try to frame an ACUS study for this committee. Ron Levin, I see your hand, please go ahead. Yeah, so you've got a collection of uh, uh, vaguely related topics and the question before the house is to what extent can we put them in the same bucket and the like. And I guess my offhand reaction is that issue exhaustion doesn't belong in the same grouping with the others uh, because the others all deal with getting into court initially. Um, 
And issue exhaustion has more to do with uh, assuming you're in court, what uh, questions can you raise? Um, now the, the, the preclusion, the, the um, uh, 827 is sort of on the borderline in that regard because it, it uh, is essentially about um, preclusion of, of raising some issues even though others uh, might, uh, might be open to you. But even then, uh, that is about statutory barriers. Whereas issue exhaustion is about uh, whether uh, is where uh, whether you could have an issue reviewed or not would depend on um, the the conduct of people uh, raising issues at an earlier time, and it seems like it's just a different uh, set of issues involved here. Now, Steph will recall that we struggled with issue exhaustion uh, somewhat inconclusively a few years ago, um, but aside from that, aside from the fact that it wasn't an altogether successful uh, venture. Um, I think it is simply qualitatively different. So if we're trying to decide going forward what issues to group together, I think it, it's probably uh, doesn't exactly fit uh, with the others. Because I think we do have a set of issues that are somewhat related uh, that would tell you, can you sue? Uh, which is not the same because in an issue uh, exhaustion context, you may be able to sue with regard to four or five issues is just the one that you potentially cannot raise because it wasn't properly raised before the agency. I take your point, Ron. I don't know that I disagree with you. On the other hand, I guess I've always thought to some extent of issue, I, I, since I think of exhaustion as a timing issue, um, you know, there's an extent to which I wonder whether there's a way of framing them to put them together. Then again, at the same time, I don't know that they have to be put together. We could we could we could have more than one project. Um, I guess another way of thinking about them, at least to the extent that um, if 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 the aspect of issue exhaustion that we were to focus on has to do with statutory provisions imposing issue exhaustion requirements. Um, you know, and, and the other two, to some extent, are also statutory. Um, I, I, I wonder to what extent they could be framed as, um, you know, if, if we're thinking in terms of recommendations to Congress, in terms of drafting judicial review statutes, whether they could be framed collectively that way or not. Um, I'm not saying they have to be, it's just another way of trying to think about them that might pull them together. Um, let me call on Bill Funk here, whose hand is raised. Well, I just wanted to speak uh, to second uh, Ron Levin's point. Uh, I mean, I, I think that the policy issues that go towards issue exhaustion and whether it should apply or not apply, and whether Congress should adopt some law regarding it, are sufficiently different from the uh, policy issues involved in the other two areas that it, it just makes sense to say issue exhaustion should be its own study if there's going to be a study. Other thoughts on this? Um, Kristen, uh, if, no, uh, I just I just have a few questions, and I, the reason yeah. I'm asking the questions because we on the staff need to figure out sort of what next steps to undertake. Right. So, with respect to issue exhaustion, are we talking principally about issue exhaustion in the context of adjudication, or are we also talking about um, revisiting the issue of is issue exhaustion in informal rulemaking? Ron Levin had alluded to that. Um, and then I, the other sort of question I have is, um, would an issue exhaustion project, would it also, would it address not only what Congress might or should do, but also what agencies should do by way of their own um, regulations? And I guess the third question, if I may, is, um, do we think that there's an issue exhaustion problem out there? The issue seems to come up in these appointment clause cases and related contexts, like in the Fleming case before the DC circuit. But um, is, there, is, is there a problem that requires the conference's attention? Don Elliott, go ahead, please. That was a, that's a great lead in, Matt, because I'm a, a big fan that we 
should really only do projects where we think there is a problem. Um, I do. Uh, I do share the view of, uh, of Bill Funk and uh, Ron Levin that uh, the issue of exhaustion topic is, is a little bit different. I think that uh, it is ripe to have a, uh, a project on uh, issue exhaustion. And my, my thinking about it is that there isn't really a, a comprehensive statute in my view that defines uh, issue exhaustion. There isn't really a, uh, a good uh, a philosophy or, or comprehensive approach to the issue of issue exhaustion. I think the courts have, have struggled with this uh, in, in particular situations. And we've now got enough information from the courts that perhaps it is right to actually have a, a traditional ACUS study that tries to pull these things together and have a, a real, a real uh, theory of when issue exhaustion is appropriate and, and when, it, when it isn't. Um, I'm familiar with this most recent Supreme Court case that, that Kristen circulated. Um, and I, I, I do think that um, simply deciding the issue based on an analogy to uh, appellate courts and whether or not a process is sufficiently adversarial that the analogy makes sense, that, that strikes me as a pretty, pretty superficial way of dealing with the issue. And it might well be right to have a, a, a study that, that tries to understand a little bit more uh, comprehensively and theoretically uh, what the purposes of issue exhaustion are uh, and, and when it's appropriate and when it isn't appropriate. So I, I would support that, but I would, I would agree with uh, some of my colleagues that it, it really is a separate subject and I don't think it should be uh, shoehorned in with the, with the other two. But I do think it's, I do think it's ripe for uh, uh, someone to uh, really uh, develop, uh, I guess the, the term that has been popularized by by some writers is under theorized. And I suppose I think that issue exhaustion is under theorized and it needs to be more theorized. Uh, let me call on Ron and then John Duffy. Yeah, I'll just be brief. Uh, uh, I think that um, although it's separate from the others, I do agree uh, with, with Don that there, there may well be room for a study of issue exhaustion in adjudication. In the rulemaking context, the project was haunted by this feeling by many people that it had no right to exist at all. There shouldn't be any such doctrine. But nobody thinks that with regard to adjudication. It's clear that there is some doctrine. Uh, it has some legitimate place. And so there is, uh, I don't like under theorized because it's a moral judgment, but it's a not very theorized um, uh, area. And we can consider whether it is indeed under theorized or whether it is uh, we have the optimal degree of, of non-theory right now. That's a, I think it's a legitimate question. John Duffy, go ahead, please. Sure, thanks. Um, I, I, I don't wanna get into a di discussion about whether it should be that two of these issues go together and, or through all three, but I think that there is a common thread here um, which is that the APA does not have any provisions really uh, saying when judicial review gets foreclosed. And I think that that's because of its history, that it, you know, it grew up in this time when there was sort of a counter move against the rise of the administrative state in the New Deal. And the judicial review provisions were some of the most controversial, led to a presidential veto of, 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 uh, a few years before. Um, so they're all about review, review, review. And even though I like review, I, I, I generally am very pro-review, I think the complete absence of any things that say, okay, you have to bring your cause of action within X number of years. You know, you have to, um, you have to bring it now in pre-enforcement review or you won't be able to raise it in enforcement. You know, just some sort of, and, and you have to raise it at the agency or forget it, you're not gonna have to raise it. You, you, won't, you won't get to raise it. I think that as much as I, I'm in favor of judicial review, all three of these have this theme that, you know, you go to the APA and you say, well, what does the APA have to say about the, these three issues? And with respect to one, 
It's the answer is nothing. The DC Circuit has instead referred us to this statute in 28 USC. With respect to, again, exhaustion is really kind of not there in the APA. Um, and then the last one, same thing you can say. So I think there is a connection here and it's, it's an attempt to fill an intellectual void that's in the original APA. Thanks. I, will, I will add the observation here. I think one of the things that connects the dots between these three to me, and, and frankly, I'm agnostic as to whether we come up with one project or two out of these. I really, I really am. Um, you know, but one thing that kind of connects the dots for me a little bit really is something of a divide between um, very sophisticated, regulated parties who have no difficulty establishing standing and who know fully well that when a rule comes down, if they want to challenge it procedurally, they need to get they need to get moving and not wait until an enforcement action comes along. Versus, you know, sort of the less sophisticated um, people who are not repeat players in front of agencies who prop may or may not have standing, but wouldn't ha really have any reason to know about a rule until they become the target of an enforcement action. And then, of course, at that point, then they want to explore their options, but maybe the limitations period for challenging procedural aspects of the rule has passed. And yet they end up feeling. Um, as if that they've been deprived of their day in court uh, with respect to a subset of issues. Um, and, you know, you know, or through an enforcement proceeding, maybe they failed to raise an issue because, again, they were unsophisticated. They didn't know how to frame their issues. And then, you know, they get better help by the time they get to the Article Three courts. Um, you know, and, and, and one of the ways in which this collection of issues kinds of comes up with this divide, I think, is particularly in our contemporary moment where we're seeing um, sort of a real divide about the efficacy and legitimacy of agency action, maybe thinking a little bit about that less sophisticated group and how they approach enforcement or enforcement approaches them um, may carry some value to it in putting these issues together. Um, but Don Elliott's been waiting very patiently. So let me call on Don and then call on Bill. Well, I, I would agree with you, Kristen, that uh, the, the issue of uh, people who are not aware of a rule and, and not uh, uh, able to challenge it until they are actually subjected to it is an, is an important issue. Um, and I think it, it, I would also support a study in, in that area. I, I do still think it's a little bit of a, a separate issue from the issue of exhaustion. And, and I think there's plenty to talk about uh, in terms of uh, exhaustion requirements. Uh, so, somebody said that uh, there really wasn't any language in the APA about exhaustion. I always thought that and taught that to my classes until I was part of a team at Covington that, that won a case in the Ninth Circuit based on some language in the APA. So I wouldn't necessarily say that, but I do, uh, I do disagree a little bit with my friend Ron Levin that we should limit a study of exhaustion, if I understood him correctly, simply to adjudication. Uh, I, I do think the problem of what should exhaustion requirements be in, uh, in, in rulemaking, uh, should, it, should it be by the party challenging it or is it sufficient that someone else has raised the issue and the courts have addressed it? Um, I, I wouldn't want to uh, sort of jurisdictionally prejudge the issue. I think if we looked at exhaustion as a, as a general doctrine and, and you know, what it was about and what its purposes should be, I wouldn't put rulemaking off the table from the get-go uh, if it if the consultants and the committee ended up deciding that we couldn't make recommendations in the rulemaking area, uh, I guess that would be okay. But I think if we do a project with regard to exhaustion, that that both adjudication and, and rulemaking um, should should be on the table, and that somebody should really think through what the underlying purposes of exhaustion doctrines are, and suggest that rather than the courts making these decisions up, you know, kind of on an ad hoc basis, that having a, a more systematic approach to exhaustion requirements would be useful. Bill Funk, go ahead, please. Well, I, I, I want to second just what uh, Don Elliott said. Uh, 
And I, I, I agreed with, with John Duffy that they all arise out of, if not ab total absence, at least incomplete uh, discussion in the APA. But that's precisely why ACUS should adopt something or, or consider something, not necessarily that they should all be put in the same basket to be considered with. And I also think in terms of trying to hire a consultant, whether a consultant would have expertise in all three of these areas, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I could consider myself an expert on exhaustion, but but not on, on the statute of limitations or something. So it seems that this mix there. And then also the idea practically when you end up going before the plenary with uh, a, a recommendation that has three different or at least two different parts that maybe uh, sink the whole thing because there's a un, you know, lack of agreement on one of them. I, I think taking them as separate is again is a good idea. But I mean, putting rulemaking and adjudication together in exhaustion, I agree with that. Steph Tatum, go ahead, please. Um, I was just going to, to note that the scope of the project led by Professor Lovers really focused on issue exhaustion um, that, that sort of arose in common law or relied on court's equitable authority. And that recommendation as originally crafted and eventually implemented as um, you know more of a statement than a recommendation set forth factors for courts to consider um, without addressing whether or not, you know, Congress should take up these issues in particular statutes. I do worry a little that the question of whether Congress should, should do this would be fraught with some of the same divisions that um, led to the last project to turn into a statement as opposed to a recommendation. But um, in general, I think this is a, a very interesting issue worth studying and even if you know we realize that statutes are inconsistent and you know there are good reasons for that that might be a helpful insight but um all that is to say i, I do think we should try and avoid to the extent possible the problem we had in the last go around with the focus on what court should be doing using their equitable authority Okay, um, well, so one thing that I am kind of hearing from this discussion is sort of a range of views from in favor of keeping exhaustion separate from agnostic about keeping exhaustion separate. So perhaps that signals that just for the sake of moving forward, the presumption ought to be that if we're going to pursue a step, if we're going to pursue a project on issue exhaustion, um, and there seems to be some support for doing so, that we treat that as a separate project, um, which then runs into the question of can we frame, um, is, is there a way that we can frame, you know, uh, topics B and D, accrual of cause of action and availability of review and enforcement proceedings as perhaps a single project, or are they properly really kept separate? Um, and either way, whether they're separate or whether they are together, are they, do they rep reflect a project that this committee is really interested in pursuing? Ron Levin, go ahead, please. I just wanted to add one sentence or, or maybe two to, to round out our discussion on exhaustion, which is that we might want to focus on um, what agencies can specify internally with regard to exhaustion. I think a problem we had with the uh, rulemaking exhaustion, uh, issue exhaustion problem was trying to opine about doctrine in the courts uh, can be divisive. But if the question is, what should agencies specify for themselves um, as steps to be taken internally, that is something that is more squarely within agencies' expertise. It doesn't require competing views on what the courts are doing. And it might be a constructive approach to issue exhaustion, whether or not we go beyond adjudication to rulemaking or we don't. I think that's a valuable point, Ron. Thank you for making it. And let me also make uh, one small note, at least with respect to exhaustion in the APA. There is language in Section 704 of the APA, uh, you know, with respect to particularly agency rules and adopt and exhaustion, as as interpreted by the court in Darby versus Cisneros. Um, you know, so I, it, and that goes along with Ron's point about thinking about what agencies themselves have to say in their own regulations, if anything, about uh, issue exhaustion. 
Um, but uh, then back to my other question with respect to topics B and D, um, is there a there there that we want to put into a project? I mean, John is sort of framed up at least something with respect to topic B is there, can we put together a cruel of cause of action with availability of review and enforcement proceedings or are they really separate with, from one another? And either way, should we pursue either one of them? John Duffy, go ahead, please. So again, I, I think there is a, a common topic here and you know, it, it, the APA does have some spots where it addresses these issues and forecloses review. But it doesn't, it lacks any kind of, you know, single provision or attempt to provide a comprehensive framework of when review uh, is, is too late um, or shouldn't be given uh, generally. Um, and, and I think that's when you want to, you know, that's, the, that's the, the theme here. It's when do you want to close the door to review? Um, and say, no, whatever happened in the past, uh, you're, you've got to treat that as not challengeable now, whether that be you know, that you can't even sue, which is the accrual of cause of action thing, that it's a statute of limitations, or in enforcement proceedings. I mean, the topic you listed is availability of, of, of review and enforcement proceedings. But of course, there's always some review and enforcement proceedings in the sense that you know, whatever the, the, the agency's, if it comes up in an, an enforcement action, the agency's decisions in the adjudication of the enforcement action can be, can be reviewed. But the real question is, can you review that, that thing that went on in the past um, that, perhaps, um, that perhaps is subject to some, one of these short statutes of limitations like the Hobbs Act 60 day rule. So I think there, you know, it would help to have, it seems to me, recommendations about um, foreclosure of, you know, when the door should be closed. And that would be probably mainly to Congress because the APA doesn't have it. Maybe some to the agencies about how they exercise various authorities that they have, like the one in 704. So let me ask you a question here, John. Um, you have demonstrated, I think, as much or more knowledge about both of these topics than most people on the committee. Do you, would you be interested in, I mean, not that I can hire consultants or anything like that, but are you interested in pursuing a project on this where you could help frame it up and if you don't want to serve as a consultant, help find a consultant and all of that sort of thing? Because I don't know that I disagree you're, you're, with you. You know you're a good committee chair when you start off with a compliment. Uh, and, then, and then you say, well, what about doing some more work? Um, you know, I think these issues are, um, you know, yeah, I would, I'd be interested in these. I'm also interested in the issue exhaustion uh, issue because um, I do, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to belabor the point because some see it as radically different, but um, I do see it as this, as this absence of of, of not complete absence, I take your point and Don Elliott's point, you know, there is, there are some, you know, occasional mess messages or mentions in the APA, but I do think that, you know, having a framework would be good. So yeah, I am interested. I frankly never have been a consultant on an ACUS project, so I don't know, even know what that means. There's so a first time for everything. Of, before I agree to it, I kind of want to know what it means because, you know, you kind of want to know what you're saying yes to. Oh, sure. Well, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's more down the road. I think what, what I am going to suggest to Matt and uh, others at ACUS is that perhaps they follow up. If, if, if the rest of the committee is amenable to this, um, if anybody has any objections, please let me know. But if the rest of the committee is amenable, um, you know, asking the folks at ACUS and John to put their heads together and see what can be come up with in terms of topics B and D in terms of framing a project and perhaps pursuing a project. Ron, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, well, I'm like John, I do know what it is to be a consultant. So that makes me hesitate to point out that I wrote an article on the subject of 82.7. <laughs> Ready. Um, but I'm going to throw out the idea 
that these also should be treated as separate and not as all part of one ball of wax. And, and, and I think the reason is that you're gonna have some rules on accrual and rules on statute of limitations uh, and uh, repose versus, um, what was it? Uh, accrual versus repose and the like, which all go to whether a case is filed too late. And that's an interesting subject. But under any view of those things, at some point, there becomes some time when it is uh, normally time barred. And then we have the second set of issues, uh, which are, can you nevertheless uh, bring something up in an enforcement proceeding, even though it would seem to be belated by normal measures, nevertheless, we cut some slack to a uh, person in an enforcement proceeding, the person whom Kristen mentioned a couple of minutes ago, who doesn't keep track of these things, and finds out about the statute for the first time when the, when the enforcers come around. Uh, and th there's a lot of case law that says, no matter what those preclusion statutes say, uh, we cut them some slack. And that's an interesting subject. Um, uh, but I think it's, it is different because uh, it's gonna come up no matter what rules we have with regard to when it, uh, it initially accrues and when it becomes time barred. Uh, outside of the enforcement context. And so you're gonna have a separate set of issues in those two areas. And sure, you could put them in the same document, but I think uh, they aren't gonna be all part of a, of a conceptual framework. At least I, I would not anticipate that. That said, uh, you didn't hear me volunteer to write a study and if John does ultimately decide that he will and the, and the conference wants to retain him, then maybe he'll make the case otherwise. John, go ahead, please. I, I just want to say that the, the two are different, but they're completely interrelated, as Ron just said, because the, the, you don't get the second issue, the availability and enforcement, availability of review enforcement proceedings, unless you have some sort of statute of limitations. If you just had no statute of limitations in, in the enforcement proceeding, you could say, well, you know, okay, do I have to, you know, maybe I have to have a parallel judicial review proceeding, but it ain't too late to seek judicial review, even if the rule was published in, you know, 1955. So I, I, I do think they're interrelated and maybe that's just me. It, well, I will say this much. Um, it does strike me that just about every recommendation that I have seen go through Agus since I, since I got involved with Agus, um, has involved dropping some sort of footnote or adding some sort of sentence that says this recommendation is not intended to address such and so issue that as we're debating the recommendation, we discover, hey, this is kind of interrelated, um, you know, and simultaneously, um, you know, oftentimes recommendations seem to sort of string together issues that, um, you know, sort of multiple issues simultaneously where they're arguably related, but there also seems to be some differentiation. So, I don't know that there's a right answer or a wrong answer about what goes together or what seems to be separate. Um, you know, my sense from listening to the conversation among the committee members is that there's more interest than not in, in addressing issue exhaustion as a separate issue, even though it has some interrelated aspects with these others. Um, whereas uh, the only person who seems especially interested in pursuing uh, although I hear no objections to pursuing topics B and D, uh, the main person who seems interested in, in, in getting involved in pursuing them seems to be John Duffy, who puts them together. So that's enough for me. Well, it's also it's also good for the conference too because if we <laughs> aggregate all this all these issues for this report yeah. that you volunteered John to write, it will save us money. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't want to get in trouble with John, so I'm not volunteering John for anything. I'm simply nudging and saying it might be worthwhile for you and John to put your heads together. Um, let me, so I feel like at this point, Matt, we have gone through our four topics that were on our agenda and given you, I think, some ideas with respect to where to go from here. Is there anything further that you think that we need to cover or otherwise, I'm happy to adjourn the meeting early.
Um, one one additional issue that, that did come up and was discussed a little bit um, during the committee proceedings on the last recommendation is certainly is addressed in John's source book, um, but is not on the list and was not referenced in the last recommendation is the issue of statutes that provide for um, review of orders and they don't say anything about rules. And then the question is, um, does um, does the review provision cover rules as well as orders? That issue has been litigated um, pretty recently, actually, at least with the National Labor Relations Board. I don't know if anybody thinks that's a worthwhile issue. We don't need any kind of answer right now, but that might be. I just point out that was another issue that had been discussed during the committee proceedings. Does anybody have any particular thoughts one way or another about that issue, as long as we are all together on the call? Don Elliott, please go ahead. Uh, it's not it's not really on that issue, Kristen, but I, I thought that the uh, there was an additional agenda item of soliciting any other suggestions for, for studies from members of the committee. And I think it's a good idea to do that. So I would just- Absolutely, You're, and you are correct. I was missing that additional agenda item. Um, I am happy to call on you for that. Let me just make sure that nobody wants to say anything about the uh, agenda, about the, the, the item that Matt just mentioned, which happens to fall at least to some extent under that heading anyway. Um, other thoughts on Matt on Matt's issue? Not my issue. Fine, the, not your issue, but the issue okay. that you just presented. Um, I'm not seeing any. So, Don, why don't you go? Or John Duffy, go ahead, please. I'll say one thing about it. Initially, seems kind of uh, to be a small issue that comes out of statutory bugs because Congress is inconsistent with its usage of the terms rules and orders. I mean. In some ways, that suggests maybe we could do some some good here because it's it's some sort of inconsistency. But it also seems like it's probably heavily dependent upon particular statutes because some statutes might make very sharp distinctions between rules and order, and therefore resist any kind of you know general rule that order should be construed to include rules. On the other hand, I certainly am aware of some agency statutes where orders, I think either expressly or through construction do, do include rules because they, they view themselves as promulgating rules through an order, which, so I don't know if there's, I think there might be, you know, it might resist any global solution, unfortunately, because Congress has fundamentally been inconsistent. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and call on Don Elliott then to present other suggestions. Or did you have a suggestion that you wanted to make, Don? Unfortunately, I don't have a suggestion. I was just saying <laughs> that I think we should open it up for okay. others if there are any suggestions. But I, I don't have one other than um, I do think that the exhaustion issue is an important one. And I've already expressed my views on that. OK, well, in that case, let me open, you know, give anybody who wants to an opportunity to make an additional suggestion for a project that this committee ought to pursue. I am not seeing any hands. Yes, I am seeing a hand from Bill Funk. Uh, I have to express ignorance as to what, if anything, ACUS has done in the past in the subject, but what constitutes a final agency action uh, is a question that, um, you know, is, is may have reached agreement in the Supreme Court, but apparently has not completely reached it in terms of what exactly it was required. Uh, and while one could, could do a, a synthesis of the cases, the question is whether or not the APA could be amended in a way that would make uh, the lack of clarity more clear. I will make one observation with respect to finality, which is that Mark Thompson and I, a few years ago, tried to write a law review article about finality, found the circuits completely in a, in a total mess about how they approached uh, the two-part test of Bennett versus Speer. But when we tried to come up with a bottom line, at least as to what should happen, uh, we were not very successful at coming up with a, a really good bottom line from that. Now, there are other people on this committee who may have really good ideas in that regard. So I don't wanna say that our failure would preclude anyone else's success, 
I will simply make the observation that if somebody does choose to pursue it, we've got an awful lot of research we might be able to pass along to help out. Uh, and then, but moreover, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly, I'm not sure exactly what anybody could do, but I'd be interested to find out. Um, John, uh, John Duffy, go ahead, please. So this is just a, a small suggestion about the, the really it's, it was the, the topic we already talked about, the judicial review and choice of court. Um, we, we discussed that mainly as an empirical project. And I guess that, that was what people were thinking, but I just wanted to say that as a suggestion, to the extent that we consider that, um, I think we should consider, you know, real sort of novel um, approaches to the district court versus uh, circuit court, especially in light of the census case, which involved extensive testimony um, that had to be built up in district court. And then we might consider, you know, sort of more, you know, innovative approaches where, for example, litigant might get to choose whether to go to circuit court or district court. But if they choose the circuit court, they give up fact finding. In other words, there's, there, there actually is some choice and the choice isn't made by Congress, the choice might be made by the litigant, but there's some price tag associated with that. That would broaden that project out a little bit to not just to be a much more policy driven pol, um, um, uh, project, also a project that's driven in, in, in light of developments that have occurred long after the 1970s recommendation. Um, and that, you know, an empirical wing of that project might help, but it might, it might talk about other, other sort of structural uh, ideas too, in light of more recent case law. So that, that's just an idea I'd throw out there to maybe in, in, include within the thought process of that first project. Thank you, John. Um, other, Don Elliott, go ahead, please. I just wanted to say, I, I support uh, John's excellent ideas about that. Uh, first project. I think those are some really good suggestions. Other thoughts, other questions, other concerns, other suggestions? Just on that first project idea, just one of the things I think that's happened here is that we've sort of got two trains that ended up on the same track. We, we, we were sort of, the ACUS, the office chairman was sort of thinking for some time based on Steph's, Stephanie's suggestion a while back, about this kind of empirical study. And then this issue arose during the last committee, set of committee proceedings about revisiting uh, 75-3. I think we'll, we, we, we need to give some more thought to it. Um, I thought Kristen's idea um, on the issue of revisiting the recommendation, uh, and I think John's ideas were very good too, by the way, just now. Um, would you, Kristen, is it your suggestion um, it, you, you did suggest the possibility, but in terms of next steps, in terms of what we should do uh, within the office of the chairman following this meeting, do you think that it would be useful to consult with agencies um, about this issue and, and obviously including the Department of Justice? Do you think that's a good next step? You know, um, to the extent that I think the consensus of the committee was that before you proceed with that project, you need to have a little bit of an idea of why we're pursuing it. Is it, you know, what are we hoping to get out of it? Because I agree with the assessment that if you're gonna go, you know, before you can really design an empirical study, there's an extent to which you have to have some sort of sense sure. of what questions it is that you want to ask. And, um, you know, I think there have been some really good ideas presented on this panel or on this in this committee meeting today but on the other hand um i do think that perhaps going to a few commit or a few agencies um including the department of justice but maybe something like social security administration um i'm not sure who else but you know maybe irs because they do a lot of adjudication i'm not sure entirely who you would go to uh but on the other hand um, it seems to me to make some sense to go get some input from those agencies. We're thinking about this project. Do you see particular issues that ought to be addressed? Um, you know, do you see particular policies that are worth pursuing? Um, and getting that sort of an input to try to help shape the project. I'm not sure why you wouldn't do that. Yeah. 
Does that make sense to you, Matt? Yeah, it sure does. Um, um, I think Social Security is probably not the agency, probably the best agency at a particular review, statutory review system. And, and I, I don't know if they want cases in the courts of appeals, but um, I, I think that is a good idea generally, yes. Um, Steph has her hand up. So Steph Tatum, let me call on you, please. Um, I was just going to comment briefly on the finality projects and apologies if there's background noise, I had to move into my commute. Um, with respect to finality, I think that we had discussed this as a committee a few years ago. And a consideration that I raised at that time um, was that agencies were in a big push at the moment to be more transparent about their guidance. And I know that this is an ongoing issue that the conference is considering right now. I think one question that I've had with finality is, you know, if ACUS took up a project and said that certain things with certain attributes were final and therefore subject to judicial review, if that would discourage agencies um, in some way from uh, having documents that meet those attributes, if, if that makes sense. And I, I noted at that time a tension between the effort to have guidance be transparent and the possibility of labeling such guidance final agency action. I, I really don't know if this concern is still salient or it's still an issue. Um, I haven't thought about it very much, but I did just want to put that out there as something for the staff um, and that to consider in the context of the other projects that their conference is working on right now. Understood. Thank you, Steph. Any other thoughts, concerns, suggestions, ideas? Seeing none um, or seeing no hands, Matt, do you have anything further? No, just this is uh, tremendously helpful. Um, and um, we will definitely follow up probably in the first instance with John on the two or three project ideas that we've discussed. And we'll give some more thought to this issue of revisiting 75.3 and um, what the next steps might be with respect to initiating a project on that particular subject or um, alternatively undertaking um, a somewhat more general empirical study, not, not directed to the formulation of recommendation, but as, as suggested um, with um, careful consideration as to what the objective of the, of the, of the, uh, of the study would be. So this is, um, this is enormously, enormously helpful. The only other thing I would say is uh, we do have this very exciting project going on in Office of the Chairman Project on nationwide injunctions. And um, we will have a report on that subject before not too long. So um, that's another initiative we're pursuing. And it's possible, possible that that study might suggest the need for um, some reforms that this committee um, might want to take up. Wonderful. Um, well, seeing no other further business, uh, I want to thank everybody for being so generous with your time today and helping us think through these ideas. And, um, you know, with that, I believe that we are adjourned.